Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My computer broke recently. Well, it didn't exactly break. It was, as they say, maxed out, full of pictures and videos. Um, on our vacation this summer, I was taking uh, pictures of important historic sites you know, in Europe and uh, ran out of space. Put on the computer, the computer was full, the camera was full, the smartphone was full. It was a problem. So I took the risky leap of backing up all the pictures and videos of my entire family history onto a backup hard drive and deleting them from the computer, which was really hard. It was hard to push the delete button. But I was trustful that I could recover this. Turns out I backed it up in a program called iPhoto. Uh, which is, and it's really hard to recover pictures from iPhoto when it's on an external hard drive in a way I didn't quite realize. So I called a computer expert and he said, you need to get a larger hard drive, like memory hard drive for your computer, and uh, we need to you know, transfer the photos back into your computer from the external hard drive and then migrate them into iPhoto. This is wonderfully uncomplicated stuff. Computers just make our lives so much better, don't they? Um, it took the better part of a week to get this actually finished. We had to use different, different computers, it turned out, which, so this was not a fun experience. But one thing that did happen was, as the, the pictures were migrating into iPhoto, they were flashing. And I got to see the running history of all the digital pictures that we've taken since about 2002, when my first son, Jacob, was born. Wow. About the time we were taking digital pictures, it was a scrolling memory of my life as a family man. I remember in particular Jacob's birth in 2002. My wife, Nayla, was eight and a half months pregnant, and late one night, she really was not feeling well. We went to the hospital, Fountain Valley Regional Hospital, to, to get her checked out in the labor and delivery department. And uh, they thought she was having pre-labor, or like, early contractions, kind of. They were just sort of like a, a faint glimmer of what a woman experiences in childbirth, and that she was being overly sensitive, and they were going to give her Maalox and send her home. Now, for those of you that know my wife, she's a tough cookie. She has a very high pain threshold. Neela grabbed my shirt and said, I am not going home. <laughs> they, had, they, had, they, had checked her, they had checked Neela for toxemia, which is a labor condition that women can have. But they assumed she didn't have it because her blood pressure was normal, which is the prime indicator. But her pain was so bad that I kept coming out to the nurse's station to ask for help. My wife's really Finally, the nurse uh, in the, at that station, and I'm sure she's a nice person, I don't know her name, but in our family uh, narrative, she's come to be known as Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> she said, sir, there are women in this apartment in a lot more pain than your wife, so she's just gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't mention this to my wife. <laughs> well, I don't think I would have survived the night. <laughs> Eventually, this nurse got a hold of the doctor at about 3 a.m. and ordered a shot of Stadol, which is a powerful pain medication. She finally was able to go to sleep exhausted. I was surprised how tired I was. I fell asleep in the chair next to her. Wiped from a really, really challenging night. The next morning at 8 a.m., a positively angelic figure came into the room. This beautiful woman, it was a nurse named Trisha, and she came in from the hallway and there was this light sort of glowing from her, <laughs> emanating around her head. And this beautiful figure came in and said, hi, I'm Trisha. She was actually nice and she wanted to help us. Neela's doctor was on vacation, so we never even saw her, but her colleague, Dr. Masserman, a fine OBGYN specialist, came to visit us. It turned out Neela had a very rare form of toxemia called HELP syndrome. It's nearly undetectable, since blood pressure doesn't rise when the mother has this, as it does when you usually have toxemia. It was only when they did a blood test and noticed elevated liver enzymes that they diagnosed her condition. Hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, HEL, and low blood platelets. That's the P-HELP syndrome. That explained the intense pain, probably emanating from Neela's liver, and the nurse's unbelievable indifference. Dr. Masterman decided it was best to induce labor, and her water was broke at 2 p.m. on April 12, 2002. Jacob's due date was April 25th. We knew that she would have a baby that day, which was pretty scary in itself. Not that we weren't preparing for it for nine months, 
but we weren't preparing for it quite at that moment. Um, but Jacob was born at 10.08 p.m., completely healthy, with extra big feet and hands. <laughs> Mom was fine, too. The key cause of symptoms in this form of toxemia is the pregnancy, and the solution is to get the baby delivered. But I vividly remember sitting at Nayla's bedside as Dr. Masterton told her, we need to get you delivered. She looked at me with terror in her eyes. Are we really going to do this? I said, honey, I think it's kind of a foregone conclusion. <laughs> and I remember her saying, well, it's not a question about whether we're getting a puppy. It's when we coax him out of the cage, right? <laughs> it was difficult to accept this and kind of scary to have to do something different than we had planned. But in the end, we were blessed with what turned out to be a moment of grace for us in our family life. Although everyone expected a baby girl, who would have been Emily Jean, and it turns out Emily and Jacob were the most common names in America those that year. <laughs> we're real original, aren't we? Uh, we brought home a perfectly healthy baby boy a few days later, Jacob Timothy, spelled with a K because my wife's German heritage. And of course, I'll never forget driving home on Warner Boulevard in Huntington Beach at about five miles per hour. <laughs> in light of this story, when I tell people that we had a baby and then tell our baby story, my wife, Nayla, rightly says, we? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you have a baby story of a child from your life that was born to you or a sibling or a friend, a spouse, Someone that came into your life and changed it forever. I can't help but think about our baby story, if I dare say that. When I read the story of Jesus' birth, as we heard this morning, in Matthew's Gospel, the story of Jesus' birth is told from the interesting perspective of Joseph. We see through the eyes of Jesus' earthly father what was going on, how he felt, and what ended up happening, according to Christian tradition. Joseph is not enthusiastic about Mary's pregnancy. It's surprising and unexpected. And although in faith we know what was going on, from Joseph's perspective, one could understand if that story, let's just say, stretched its credibility a little bit. He wanted to dismiss Mary quietly as a favor. In that culture, a pregnant, unwed woman was deserving of something much worse than a repudiation and or rejection by the husband-to-be. So it seems Joseph shows Mary grace just in this. But then something strange happens to Joseph. He has a dream where an angel appears to him and visits, uh, visiting on God's behalf, explaining all that's happening, who Jesus is, what his name means, and what Joseph's role in this will be. This is a big moment for Joseph. How will he react? Is this angel to be believed? Would he really accept this role of becoming a father in questionable circumstances? According to the customs of his culture, he was bringing shame and dishonor in his family and even staying with Mary at all. Most women would long have been dismissed and forgotten, the child and woman left to be raised somewhere else. But Joseph shows grace in that he accepts what, mu what must have sounded at first like the most absurd of stories, and he accepts his role in Jesus' birth and life, and thus in God's plan of salvation. He is truly a gracious father. Like Mary, but in a different way, Joseph shows grace in accepting his destiny, even though it didn't fit his plans. Joseph's role in the drama of salvation is often overlooked, and understandably so. We hear every Christmas Eve the story of Christmas from Luke's uh, pen. And there, Mary figures prominently. Mary is an important figure in Luke's gospel. And uh, salvation comes through a woman. That's important. As Martin Luther himself said, if Mary had not believed, she could not have conceived. That is to say, the salvation of the cosmos, of the entire known universe, hinges on the faith of a peasant woman from ancient Palestine. That's the nature of of our Christian faith. But Joseph truly was Jesus' earthly father, and he had an important role to play as well. You get the sense when reading this text how important that role is, even if the church has forgotten it, 
and how graciously he accepted it. Without Joseph's consent, the story would have turned out very differently indeed. Perhaps the lesson for us is that God comes into our lives and often has very different plans than the plans we've laid out for ourselves. Those of us who've had children know that they turn our lives upside down in a wonderfully yet challenging sort of way. In every baby story, there is a twist, something unexpected, an opportunity to yield to God's grace and hopefully to God's will. It's not easy to do this, to be sure, but there is good news in letting go, for our lives are not in our own hands. And when we let go, we no longer have to worry about how they will come out. We can trust that because God is with us, all shall be well, even if things don't go according to plan. Which, by the way, they won't. <laughs> Joseph knew this. I believe it was his Christmas gift. We too can receive this gift when we let go and hand our lives over to God, for God is good. The gracious Father in the story ultimately is not just Joseph, but God. We know this because of the little baby who was born for us in Bethlehem, the Savior of his people. <laughs>